Good afternoon, uh, colleagues. The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions, and the portfolio today is education and skills. As ever, if uh, a member wishes to ask a supplementary, uh, I would invite them to press the request to speak buttons or place an R in the chat function if they're joining us online during the relevant question. Uh, there's quite a bit of interest in the questions this afternoon, so brief questions and uh, responses to match would be helpful. And I call question number one, Michelle Thompson. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government which elements of the Cumberford Little report it sees as relevant for its forthcoming review of the skills landscape, and particular in relation to the stated purpose of optimising the system for upskilling and reskilling. Minister Jamie Hepburn. Yeah, Presiding Officer, James Withers is leading the independent review of the skills delivery landscape in Scotland. The review commenced in September and it will be for him to decide which evidence he considers and which individuals, institutions and organisations he consults. Michelle Thompson. I thank Mr for his response. He will be aware that the Cumberford Little Report argued the case for a stronger focus on skills excellence rather than mere competence. Does the Minister therefore agree that such an ambitious focus for the skills sector should be considered by the review and that it fits with the stated purpose, and I quote, the specific functions, remit and status of Skills Development Scotland? Minister. Yeah, well, the first thing I would uh, observe, President Officer, is uh, I'm happy to say I see excellence in our uh, system uh, already, but the purpose of the review is to ensure that we have a skills system fit for the future challenges we face. And I can certainly say that must be one based on excellence. Uh, that is why we have initiated the review, uh, which will not look not only at just at SDS, but across the wider uh, skills landscape. And it is one uh, with parameters to ensure that we have an ambitious focus uh, for, for, the, for the future. But I would uh, reiterate, uh, of course, President Officer, it is for James Withers to consider uh, the points that Michelle Thompson has raised, given the independent nature of the review. Brief supplementary, Pam Gozel. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Apprenticeship contribution rates have remained static for around a decade, and now there are fears of a freeze on apprenticeship places until next year. Naturally, many small and micro-sized businesses are concerned about the potential impact of this. Can the Minister clarify, will there be a freeze on apprenticeship places until next year? And will the Government commit to an independent review of apprenticeship contribution rates? Minister. Uh, there is no freeze on uh, apprenticeships uh, this year. It was an officer. Uh, there are still uh, many uh, places uh, available to be taken up in terms of the contracts that have been awarded, and they should uh, be uh, fulfilled. So let us be clear, there is no freeze on apprenticeship places uh, this uh, year. In terms of contribution rate, uh, that is something I would expect Skills Development Scotland, as the agency tasked with these matters, to consider in conjunction with any uh, agency that is looking to consider those matters. Question two is not lodged. Question three, Gordon Macdonald. To ask the Scottish Government what action is being taken to tackle skill shortages. Minister. In our strategy for economic transformation has set our commitment to ensuring employers have the supply of skills they need. In 2021-2022, the National Transition Training Fund, the North East Economic Recovery and Skills Fund provided over 23,000 training interventions across a range of sectors. And to attract people to Scotland, we have committed to launch a Talent Attraction Migration Service in 2023, which builds on our Talent Attraction programme to attract workers from the rest of the UK. Gordon MacDonald. I thank the, the Minister for that response. I share the concerns of the Construction Industry Training Board in filling the skills gap across the sector, from bricklayers to building safety to digital skills and skills relating to energy efficiency to address our commitment to net zero. CITB have suggested we need an additional 26,000 construction workers by 2025, but with access to previously available EU workers no longer an option, coupled with the skills gap, can the Minister advise what action is the Scottish Government to tackle this problem? Minister. Well, I certainly recognise uh, the nature of the challenges. These are challenges I have been able to discuss directly with the sector, including the Construction Industry uh, Training uh, Board. Uh, I have laid out some of the uh, activity that we are undertaking, including trying to attract others from uh, other parts of the UK to come uh, to Scotland. But in terms of what we are doing uh, here uh, and now, uh, in 2020-21, there were over 11,000 construction and property students uh, in Scotland. Uh, that is about 9 per cent of full-time equivalent places in our colleges. Uh, apprenticeships are, of course, continue to be a key mechanism in pro promoting employer investment in the construction sector. In 2021-2022, uh, the Scottish Government ha had uh, 
6,540 people into modern apprenticeships in the construction sector, the highest number on record and a 30 per cent increase in the previous year. In addition, construction has accounted for the highest level of individual training account uh, usage, and alongside this, almost 600 employers in the sector have access to flexible workforce development funds since 2018. So we have a range of initiatives underway, but of course I recognise there is more to do, and that is something I am committed to taking forward. Thank you. I have got a couple of supplementaries. First, Stephen Kerr. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Also, so on the basis of that answer, and on the basis of a whistleblower who has contacted us, can the Minister confirm whether Skills Development Scotland has had any of its budget reclaimed by the Scottish Government for this year? Minister. Well, I think it is no secret the, the Deputy First Minister has stood in his feet in this chamber to talk about the process that we are undertaking to try and manage some of the cost pressures this year. But if that is a reference to the question that has been asked by Pam Gosell, uh, and but, you know, we don't need any form of whistleblower uh, to, to, to raise these issues. Pam Goldsworth has raised the issues. There is no freeze on the recruitment of modern apprenticeships this year, which is the core activity of Skills Development Scotland, and they will continue to deliver on the programmes and the projects they have in place. And Martin Whitfield. Grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. When it comes to skills shortages, can the Minister comment on Derek Smeal's evidence to the Education and Children and Young Persons Committee on September the 21st, when he said the reality is that when we did our own analysis, we found that as we go forward in the presence of chronic underfunding, there is a reason why I use that term, the impact looks at this early stage to be likely to mean a reduction in my workforce of 25% by the end of year five. That's 2027. How is that helping our skills shortage? Minister. Well, I engage. Uh, I, I recognise there are obviously challenges uh, in relation to the college sector. We will work closely with them to make sure we find a, a way through that. Of course, there is the independent review uh, that is underway to make recommendations. We are responding to the Scottish Funding Council's uh, review into sustainability and coherence of uh, provision. So we are working our way through these matters. But in terms of the budgetary position, I would have thought Mr Whitfield would recognise and understand that as a consequence of decisions being taken by the UK Government, there is significant pressure on the Scottish Government's budget. So if it is Labour's view that there should be more invested into this area of activity, then I look forward to them coming forward to suggest what other area of the budget should be cut from. Question number four, uh, Fiona Hislop, who joins us online. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will amend education support guidance to distinguish between voluntary home education as a matter of choice and involuntary home education as a matter of necessity. Cabinet Secretary. Opting to home educate your children should always be a choice and no family should feel they have to withdraw their child from local authority education. There is a clear duty on education authorities to provide an education for all children in their area, especially children with additional support needs. Fiona Hislop. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that there is a small number of pupils who have very serious difficulty in physically being in school because of their neurodiversity or struggle with the mental health. Does the Cabinet Secretary acknowledge the difference between those parents who voluntarily home educate as a choice and those parents and children who have it involuntarily imposed on them as the only possible way they can engage in education? And can the Scottish Government amend the draft guidance being consulted on to reframe this involuntary home education as a necessity rather than a choice? As local authorities they, they can't provide discretionary support without such a change in guidance. And what support can the Scottish Government offer in the meantime to those young people so they do not miss out on education? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I thank uh, Fiona Hislop for her continued interest um, in this matter? As I said in my original answer, home education should always be a positive choice by a family and rightly no one should be required to home educate. Local authorities do have that duty to provide a suitable education to every pupil. And despite the challenges that individual pupils face, a local authority must support every child. I am very sympathetic to the wide range of situations where children and young people may struggle at school, and I recognise that that may lead a family to consider home education. However, where a family feels that school education is not meeting the needs of their children, I would expect the local authority to work with that family 
to resolve any concerns. On the matter of uh, guidance, uh, I know uh, the member is well aware of the consultation uh, that the government has um, at the moment. Local authorities do have the power to respond to a request for discretionary access to a range of resources, including from home educated pupils, and the responses will depend on the support that is requested. Our guidance does encourage local authorities to support home educating families where it is possible. But again, I would thank Fiona Hislop for her continued interest in the matter, note our recent correspondence, and will consider that as we consider all aspects um, regarding the guidance uh, during our consultation process. Well, uh, brief supplementaries. First, Faisal Chowdhury. Thank you, Deputy, <coughs> Deputy Presiding Officer. In cases where home education is a matter of necessity, what support can the Scottish Government to provide to ensure that children have the connectivity and equipment needed for a modern education? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, as I said in my answer to Fiona Hislop, uh, home education should always be a positive choice and not a matter of necessity. The guidance, uh, as it's uh, currently configured, it does allow for local authorities to be able to uh, assist uh, families um, with requests for discretionary access to a range of resources, and that might include aspects around uh, connectivity. And Michael Mara. Thank you, President Officer. The consultation on home education comes at a particularly challenging time for local authorities. I have pressed the Cabinet Secretary on numerous occasions to do more to find out about how many pupils are not returning to school following the pandemic, many of whom are moving on to forms of home education. So will the Cabinet Secretary commit to a full analysis of how many young people across Scotland have disengaged from education, the number of families struggling to get their kids back into school, and accompany that with a real plan for education recovery? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, it, it is an issue which um, is uh, discussed uh, both uh, within government at a national level and at a local level. Uh, this isn't a matter that's just happening um, in Scotland, but in other jurisdictions um, as well. So I recognise there is a challenge of some young people returning, particularly to full-time education, um, because of the pandemic. I would reassure uh, the member that we are taking this issue very seriously, as is Education Scotland, as our local authorities, and we will continue uh, to analyse and to do um, what is necessary to be able to support schools, to be able to support young people uh, get the education that they are, of course, entitled to. Question number five is withdrawn. Question six, Tess White. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the actions that are being taken to recruit teachers in primary and secondary schools. Cabinet Secretary. Local councils are responsible for the recruitment and deployment of their staff. This includes providing a complement of teachers which best meets the needs of each of their schools and its pupils within the resources available. During the pandemic, the Scottish Government provided an additional £240 million to local authorities to support the recruitment of additional teachers and support staff. We have since committed further permanent funding of £145.5 million a year to further support education staffing. This provides assurance of funding for councils and removes this as a barrier to employing staff on permanent contracts. Tess White. Cabinet Secretary. In the summer holidays, Aberdeenshire schools were only sent a handful of, an, of the newly qualified teachers they requested, with particular gaps in STEM. Meanwhile, other parts of the country have been given surplus teachers they don't need. Those issues are long-standing and show no signs of abating, with the effect that pupils aren't getting the same teaching in key subjects just because of where they live. Ahead of the next school year, what action is the Scottish Government taking to ensure the system for allocating new starts does not overlook our brilliant schools in the North East outside of the Central Belt? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, of course, the uh, decision on um, where a probationer uh, may wish uh, to take up the probationary year um, is for that individual to consider where they wish to go. We cannot make probationers go to different parts of the country. Uh, there is a process which happens um, that allows them to uh, give a number of their options that they would wish uh, to go to. Um, so I think we do need to bear cognizance of the fact that there is an individual choice part of this as well. Uh, but I do recognise that in particular areas uh, there are uh, shortages, particularly in some aspects um, of education, STEM being one of them. And there are other aspects within uh, Scotland um, where there is not such a similar um, challenge. Uh, so we will always consider what can be done at a Scottish Government level um, and within uh, the initial teacher education 
to provide information uh, to those going through initial teacher education about the options that are available. There is a responsibility, of course, within local authorities uh, to be able to ensure that they are doing everything that they can. Now, I admit there are challenges um, for that. I'm quite happy to work with individual councils where those challenges um, arise, but we do have to take account of the fact uh, that there are individual choices that are made by individual probationers and those moving in uh, to full-time education um, posts where they may also wish to decide to go to particular areas. And that will present challenges, uh, and that is something that we are very cognisant of. My supplementary, Stephen Kerr. One of the issues relating to recruitment and retention of teachers is the state of the morale of the profession, and that is in large measure being driven also by the incidence of violence in classrooms against teachers. There have been some very disturbing reports published very recently by the EIS and other bodies trying to quantify the level of incidence in classrooms. So what is the Cabinet Secretary doing? What initiatives, what plans has the Cabinet Secretary got to help and support teachers in those very difficult situations? Cabinet Secretary. It, well, this uh, is an exceptionally important um, issue, and I thank Stephen Kerr for, for, for raising it. I think he has done in, in the past as well, and certainly colleagues have. Uh, we are, of course, in close contact with all the teaching unions, uh, and I have spoken to the teaching unions directly about their concerns about violence um, within um, schools or, indeed, any harassment. There is no place and no excuse um, for uh, an attack, either verbal or physical, on a teacher or a member of support staff, anybody involved um, in education. There is, of course, guidance that is made available on a national level. It is up to schools to be able to uh, decide what the um, right um, process and penalty and decisions happen on an individual basis, but certainly anything that can be done at a national level, uh, I would be very keen uh, to work with the trade union colleagues to see what can be done on that. Question 7, Gillian Mackay. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to support the workforce skills needed to pursue a transition towards a fossil-free future. Minister. It's supporting Scotland's current and future workforce to develop the skills needed for the net zero transition is a priority for this Government. Our commitment to green skills in the just transition is clearly set out in the National Strategy for Economic Transformation, and we are already making strong progress in this area. We will be updating our first Climate Emergency Skills Action Plan in 2023, and we are working with the skills agencies to ensure that our existing skills programmes are providing people with the skills that employers will need as they move to greener ways of working. Gillian Mackay. I thank the Minister for that answer. A recent report by Scottish Renewables found that over 27,000 people in Scotland are directly employed in Scotland's renewable sector. With fossil fuel supplies likely to be impacted this winter, the need to accelerate the transition toward a green future has never been greater. Can the Minister outline what steps the Scottish Government is taking to ensure that the Green Jobs Workforce Academy and similar programmes are boosting skills and employment across Scotland and in my central Scotland region? Minister. Well, in terms of uh, our Green uh, Jobs Workforce Academy, it has been undertaking uh, good early initial work. Uh, we have seen through the divine design phase uh, learning uh, from that and building on, existing, um, on successful existing programmes such as the National Transition Training Fund and Young Persons uh, Guarantee. That is informing the evidence base of what we need to do in uh, the longer term to support the scale and breadth of uh, retaining and reskilling uh, across the workforce with the very challenges that uh, Gillian Mackay has uh, mentioned. Uh, SDS has undertaken a detailed impact assessment of the Academy to date, including drawing out information on the profile of users and uh, sexual interest. And that data is informing the development of the next phase of the Academy. And supplementary, Sue Webber. Thank you. Yesterday, Chris Stark from the UK Climate Change Committee stated to the Convener Group meeting that having a properly skilled workforce and jobs to facilitate the economic transition to net zero is the top issue. The Eco House project in West Lothian College is a prime example of the college sector and government funding working together to upskill Scotland and pursue a, tradition, a transition towards a fossil free future. It will see the development of two semi detached houses at the Livingston campus, and these will form a state of the art training facility in the heart of West Lothian to support the development of skills and knowledge and practical experience in its sustainable construction and efficient and effective new renewable energies, all underpinned by current and new technologies. This is a prime example of what the Scottish Government, college sector and private sector should be doing to meet the challenge facing our country tackling climate change. 
So will the Minister commit to providing the funding to replicate this innovative, groundbreaking project, EcoHouse project, throughout the Scotland? Minister. Well, what we do, of course, is the, uh, support the college sector to respond, just as is happening in West Lothian College, in a creative fashion to support uh, their local communities and their local uh, economy to uh, take up this direct uh, challenge. So I've seen a, a range. Of, I mean, that is a, obviously a very good example of what is happening in West Lothian College, and they'd be commended for it. But if you were to go to uh, Borders College, you would see through uh, the STEM centre that they have constructed some of the stuff they are doing to support uh, the transition. If you were to go to any college in the country, you would see a range of activities. So that is already happening. Of course, we uh, will uh, get behind it, and we will. Support it as best we can. And question eight, Jeremy Balfour. <coughs> uh, thank you, Deputy President. Officer, to ask the Scottish Government, <coughs> excuse me, what work is doing to improve attainment across primary education in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we are absolutely committed to improving attainment and substantially eliminating the poverty related attainment gap by 2026. We are investing an increase £1 billion in the Scottish Attainment Challenge over the course of this parliamentary term to do that. Primary schools will benefit from £520 million of pupil equity funding, empowering teachers who know their pupils best to focus on improved attainment. The new framework for recovery and accelerating progress requires local authorities to set ambitious stretch aims on improving attainment and closing the poverty-related attainment gap, including improvement in literacy and numeracy in primary education. Local authorities are currently providing these stretch aims, and Education Scotland will support them in implementing the improvements. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, despite what the Cabinet Secretary said, the Scottish Government are failing Scotland's children. As the National Improvement Framework report shows, attainment levels are declining across the board. Does the uh, Cabinet Secretary acknowledge that there are now less teachers and less schools than there were when the SNP came to power in 2007? And is he worried that despite the hard work of our teachers and support staff, the SNP are overseeing declining attainment levels in Scottish schools? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I am disappointed by, by the tone and inference of Jeremy Balfour's um, supplementary um, there. I think it does uh, a real discredit to the good work uh, that is happening within Scottish education. Before the pandemic, the year-on-year -year trend in curriculum for excellence levels, the ASIL data was positive. Uh, there were positive um, signs. Clearly, there has been an impact from the pandemic. I do not think that is surprising. It is not something that is just happening in Scotland. But when it comes to teacher numbers, we of course have the ratio of pupils to teachers at its lowest level since 2009, with more teachers than at any time in 2008. And we have the most teachers, if Mr Balfour would like to actually listen to the answer to the question, he might learn something. We have more teachers per pupil than any nation in the UK. So we will continue uh, to invest and support local authorities in the recruitment and tension of teachers, and we will continue to fulfil our manifesto commitment um, on both attainment and their investment in teacher numbers. And supplementary, Christine Graham. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Poverty has a huge impact on children's ability to learn. So does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that any child would find it difficult to learn on an empty stomach? So free school meals P1 to P5, the child payment of £25 per week for every child in a qualifying family and the extension of this to children up to 16 all from the 14th of November, will play an enormous part in improving attainment of all our children in schools. Cabinet Secretary. Well, Christine Graham, as always, Presiding Officer, uh, makes um, a very salient point. The um, ability for the Scottish Government uh, to assist uh, children and young people is not just through our education policies, but also through our wider work on child poverty. Of course, that situation would be made much easier if it was not for the devastating impact of successful UK government welfare reforms imposed since 2015. If we had seen some of those welfare reforms reversed, including the two-child limit, the removal of the £20 uplift to universal credit, and the 2015 to 2020 benefit fees, amongst others, that would put £780 million into the pockets of Scottish households and left 70,000 people, including 30,000 children, out of poverty next year. So we will do, as we always have done, presiding officer, everything we can to support children and young people. It is unfortunate that the UK government continues to make that much more difficult than it needs to be. Thank you. That concludes portfolio questions. There will be a brief pause before we move to the next item of business. <laughs>